Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar on improving the built environment. I'm just going to give a few more seconds to let any last minute attendees log on and then we'll get the presentation started. All right. So again, today's presentation is on uh, build and performance monitoring. Uh, I will be your presenter today. My name is Shannon Ryerson. I am a senior inside sales rep here at Onset. Uh, I specialize in data logging selection and application support. And my uh, primary focus is on the build and performance uh, market. So just some housekeeping details. Uh, the webinar will run for approximately 50 minutes today. We'll try to save about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer any questions. Uh, please type your questions into the uh, question section on the control panel. The webinar is being recorded uh, and a link of this recording will be sent in a follow-up email to you. So a little bit about Onset. Uh, we do make the Hobo data loggers. We are located on Cape Cod, Massachusetts uh, in Bourne. Our sole focus is on accurate and reliable data logging and monitoring solutions. We are a world leader in data logging with a global network of distributors. We do hold an ISO 9001-2015 certificate and our company was founded in 1981. So here's uh, an outline of our agenda. Uh, a few things we're going to be covering is what is a data logger, some common applications for monitoring, ways to access your data, an overview of HoboNet IoT monitoring solutions, important factors to consider when selecting a data logger, uh, answers to frequently asked questions. We'll include a few application stories, and again, we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. So what is a data logger? Uh, a data logger is an electronic, electronic instrument uh, that records measurements at a set interval over a period of time. Typically, these are uh, battery operated compact devices equipped with internal microprocessors, data storage, and one or more sensors. Uh, the data loggers that we offer can be deployed in indoor, outdoor, or underwire environments. And typically, these can record data for years at a time uh, while being unattended. So for today, we'll be fo uh, focusing mostly on our build and performance data loggers. So some common uh, environments and applications are listed out here. This could be, you know, temperature monitoring, relative humidity monitoring, uh, CO2, uh, air velocity or pressure in uh, compressed airlines, as well as VOCs. Uh, for energy, we have uh, quite a few options for that. It could be as simple as a plug load data logger, which could go in line between, you know, say like a vending machine and a wall outlet. We also have devices for doing kilowatt, kilowatt hours, um, amps, voltage, power factor. Uh, we also have sensors for doing AC and DC current and voltage. Uh, we also offer differential pressure sensors, gauge pressure sensors. Uh, we, our loggers do have the ability to accept four to 20 milliamp signals. So if you had a third party sensor you wanted to connect to one of our data loggers or maybe a piece of equipment uh, that output that type of signal, uh, you can connect it to our loggers to record it. Uh, we can also record pulse signals, DC voltage, and then we also have uh, tilt and acceleration data loggers. For our time of use data loggers, uh, we do have options for both uh, light on and off, motor on and off, state changes, as well as an occupancy slash light on and off. Uh, and here's just an overview of some of our underwater and outdoor uh, environment environmental measurements we can take. Now, while these uh, a lot of these are for you know outside the uh, indoor environment. Uh, you could certainly use them in indoor environments. Uh, for example, some of our, you know, outdoor or water temperature data loggers, uh, there's no issue with using those, um, you know, inside like say a cold room 
or storage room, warehouse, things like that. Um, for weather, we have your typical meteorological data that we uh, can capture, temp and RH, par, wind speed, direction, rainfall, solar radiation, leaf wetness. And then for others, um, again, it would be our analog signals that we can capture. So 420 milliamp, pulse or DC voltage. And again, this can be beneficial if um, you have a third party sensor uh, that you would like to connect to our data logger to capture the information from. It's just a matter of setting up um, the scaling factor, which would be, you know, what is the min and max reading versus what is its output? And then our data logger will scale that linearly. So a little bit about our Hobo uh, monitoring solutions. These are uh, research grade devices uh, that can be put, um, uh, put the power of accurate, liable data at the fingertips, at your fingertips, so you can make informed decisions for a sustainable tomorrow. Um, and this could be something for like, you know, evaluating the performance and impact of renewable energy sites on such as green roof or spaces. Um, also, the ability to enable energy use insights to lower costs and conserve resources, and also for assessing indoor air quality and optimizing HVAC system performances to improve occupant comfort and health while reducing your energy usage. Here we are kind of outline just some of our common uses of data loggers in different environments, you know, so for example, starting uh, from left to right going clockwise, you know, you could have a remote monitoring um, system or standalone weather station up on a green roof or green space to uh, record environmental data. Um, also, you know, next would be our occupancy slash light data loggers that could um, be applicable for, you know, say if you have automated um, light switches in your conference rooms and you want to ensure that they're turning on and off uh, when they're supposed to. And then also if they are performing the way they are, you know, say for example, someone comes in the room, lights automatically come on, then after they leave and, you know, it doesn't detect any motion for, for a few minutes that the lights will automatically shut off. Uh, this data logger can certainly help you uh, determine if that is the case. Uh, also for comfort levels, we got temperature and relative humidity. Um, again, out in uh, an agricultural setting, you could have, you know, weather data and climate to help you make uh, uh, educated decisions on, you know, perhaps when you should be watering your crop or you know, are you overwatering it, underwatering it, things like that. Um, for water quality, a lot of times that comes into play with uh, wastewater management. A lot of times, you know, before you discharge um, treated water back into a river or stream, you need to make sure that it meets EPA regulations regarding, you know, temperature and salinity, conductivity. Our data loggers will help uh, prove that you aren't uh, causing an adverse impact when you are discharging that treated water. Um, some other options uh, for water monitoring would be temperature and light, you know, say you're monitoring um, uh, uh, aquatic vegetation and you want to know how much light is getting down to where you're growing uh, this aquatic vegetation and what the temperature is to ensure that it's in optimal uh, conditions to ensure you get the maximum yield. And then lastly, um, our indoor monitoring of uh, CO2. Um, which for that particular data logger, which we'll go into a little bit more, um, not only does it do CO2, but it also will give you a temperature and relative humidity reading, uh, which can certainly uh, ensure that you are providing the most comfortable atmosphere for employees, clients, guests, things of that nature. So we have a few different ways that we can access uh, uh, data from our loggers. The first one would be our USB style data loggers. Essentially, these are ideal for uh, short-term short deployments uh, where you just want to look at trends in that data. Say, for example, you're going in and doing an audit. Um, I'll use the picture here as an example in a conference room to ensure that the lights are going on and off as scheduled so you're not wasting energy and maybe it's you know a week or two deployment. Something like this would be ideal. You put it in place, let it record its data. Um, remove it from the deployment site, offload the data to look at that uh, information. Uh, so the way this log would work is that you would connect it to a computer running our Hobo software with a USB cable. 
to configure and launch that data logger. Next, you put it in your deployment place, let it record data. At the end of its deployment, you would simply reconnect it back to a computer running the Hoboware software to offload it. And then from there, within our software, you can process, analyze, and present that data. Here are some common USB loggers that we offer. Uh, again, going clockwise, um, we have our uh, indoor temperature and relative humidity data logger, uh, which carries a 2.5% accuracy on the RH sensor. And with the temperature sensor, you're looking at about 0.38 degrees. Uh, next would be our plug load data logger. Again, this is uh, an ideal logger if you have, you know, uh, a small piece of machinery that you want to be able to capture, you know, essentially any type of uh, energy parameter on, such as volts, amps, watts, watts, uh, watt hours, kilowatt, kilowatt hours. Um, this essentially just goes in line between that piece of equipment and the wall outlet, uh, and you can run it as both a meter and a data logger. Next, we have our Hobo four channel thermal couple data logger. Uh, this data logger is ideal uh, for situations where you need to monitor temperatures that are either you know, extremely hot or extremely cold. Uh, the thermal couple sensors certainly have a much wider range of uh, temperature monitoring. Um, one common area I see this particular data logger used is in concrete curing. Uh, a lot of times you need to measure that internal temperature of the concrete as it cures to make sure it hits a specific range to ensure that it has cured correctly. Uh, with thermal couple data loggers, it's just a matter of sticking that wire into the concrete. Once you're done monitoring it, you simply clip that wire, resolder the end of it, and then you're good to move it on to the, uh, the next job. As we had seen a couple times already, we also have our uh, occupancy slash light on and off data logger. Uh, not only does this uh, track when the lights are on and off, it also tracks uh, when there are people in and out of the room. So again, you can correlate, did the lights turn on when someone was in the room and then after they left the room and it was idle for five minutes, did the light shut off? And then lastly, we have our Hobo State Logger, uh, which essentially you can use this for multiple applications. So pulse recording, state changes, uh, you know, that could be from a relay or something, um, motor on and off, really uh, any type of application where you don't necessarily need that uh, when the event happened, just how many times that it happened when, within a given logging interval. And here's an example of just some of these data loggers in option. Again, top left corner is our thermal couple data logger, which is being used in a high heat um, uh, environmental chamber. Next, we have uh, one of our uh, standard temperature and relative humidity data loggers that is uh, also within uh, an environmental chamber. Uh, one of the benefits to having that external cable is it does allow you to keep the data logger outside of uh, the application. So you uh, you know can easily do spot checks, you know, see what's going on while just feeding that sensor to the inside of the machine. Um, and then again, bottom left is our occupancy slash light on and off data logger. And then lastly, we have our motor on and off data logger. Um, this is a really beneficial tool if you're just looking to determine, you know, how often, you know, say um, like a compressor motor is running or HVAC motor or something like that. The way this works is that there is a, an internal magnet on it and uh, you essentially calibrate it to what the motor looks like when it's on versus what it looks like when it's off and as that motor spins um, the logger detects that ac magnetic field to determine that it's running and then when it shuts off um, you know it will also mark again that that's when the motor had sh shut off so it allows you to determine runtime and then also percent of the time on versus percent of the time off So the next option we have um, uh, for our loggers would be uh, Bluetooth data loggers, um, which most people nowadays are familiar with uh, Bluetooth technology. So I won't dive too deep into what that is, um, but if anyone's ever owned a Bluetooth speaker and connected to the phone, um, our data loggers are essentially the same way, just a little bit more simplified. So using a Bluetooth data logger, um, it uh, essentially is a versatile, low-cost solution for monitoring a wide range of measurements. You know, we have options for temp and RH, um, 
uh, current, AC current, DC current, AC voltage, DC voltage. Um, this streamlines the data collection process with convenient wireless setup and also download from hard to reach locations. And all this is downloaded right to your mobile device or a Windows computer um, running our free Hobo Connect app. And again, uh, just like all of our other data loggers, these are compact, battery powered, and easy to deploy. Um, I see uh, our Bluetooth loggers coming into play um, a lot of times if you're going out and doing energy audits or you know HVAC monitoring, say at like a client facility or a school uh, office setting where you know you need to collect this data. You need to go and get this data, you know, say once a week or once every two weeks, but you don't want to interrupt, you know, a classroom or an office. Um, the Bluetooth signal has about a hundred feet line of sight range from logger to the gateway. So if you had these in a classroom, say tucked up at like in an HVAC or something, um, nine times out of 10, you can stand right outside the classroom door, open up the Hobo Connect app, connect to the logger that's in there, offload the data, restart it, continue on to the next one without ever having to access that room. So here's just a slight overview of our Hobo Connect app. Um, it uh, allows you to easily locate and view loggers all within range. And again, that's about 100 feet line of sight, no pairing required. Um, and that's why I mentioned before, if you've ever used like a Bluetooth speaker or uh, Bluetooth headphones with your cell phone, it's the same way, but without loggers, don't have to pair it. It always broadcasts that Bluetooth signal. So as long as you're within range, uh, you open up that Hobo Connect app, any loggers that are within range will populate on the app as a logger you can connect to. Simply tap on it and then you'll have access to it. And then again, this just outlines some of that. Connect to the log, tap on the log you wanna to connect to. Configure a logger by selecting the logging interval. Uh, so with our Bluetooth loggers and USB loggers, they can log as fast as once a second or as slow as once every 18 hours. And essentially you can choose any variable in between those two thresholds. Um, also gives you the ability to program um, alarms. You can also add passwords, um, which again, as I mentioned, these are always broadcasting their Bluetooth signal, but if you don't want you know, anyone who has a Hobo Connect app to be able to connect to your loggers you can set a password on it. So if they did try to connect to it, they would need to know what that password is before they can gain access to it. And then also you can start and stop the logger right from your mobile device. Uh, once you offload the data, you know, it only takes a matter of seconds, even if the logger's memory is completely filled up. Uh, once it's offloaded from the app to your phone, you can simply export it out of the app as either a CSV, XLS, Hobo file. We also do offer um, a, a graphical readout option, which you could uh, export as a PNG file. So uh, right here, we're outlining some of our newest uh, Bluetooth data loggers that we have introduced, and that would be our MX1104 and MX1105 data loggers. Both of these are four channel loggers, but they are a little different. So the MX1104 does have a built in temperature, relative humidity and light sensor, but we also incorporated a uh, fourth analog channel that would allow you to connect any of our uh, self-describing sensors that were released with these loggers to this logger. So again, um, just to make an example, you know, say you're, you're monitoring um, air temperature or something, uh, or tepid RH in uh, a duct system, but then you also want to monitor current of the compressor that's running. You know, you can use this to log uh, the temp in RH and then also connect uh, one of our current transformers to it to uh, monitor the amp draw from the compressor that's running. Uh, the MX1105, uh, this doesn't have any internal sensors. So essentially it allows you to connect up to four of our self-describing sensors to this. So just a brief overview of the loggers, it does uh, support a wide range of measurements, included light, temperature, RH, energy, and more. Uh, they are designed to withstand harsher um, than normal work environments uh, with their IP54 rated housing. 
So essentially what that means is if, you know, you have say like a, a cold room or something that periodically they come in and they do a spray down in it. This log would probably be more ideal as opposed to having to use one of our outdoor loggers um, that are uh, weatherproof. Um, you know, as long as they're not directly spraying the logger uh, with the hose and it's just some overspray, uh, it's protected enough where you don't have to worry about damaging that logger, unlike our other uh, indoor only data loggers. Uh, it does have an LCD screen on it uh, to display uh, the current parameters of the logger, which is, you know, makes it a little bit more easy for doing spot checks, things like that. And then, as I've been mentioning, we do have self-describing sensors for these, which makes for fast and easy deployment. So what the self-describing sensors are is um, there's actually a little uh, circuitry built into the sensor itself, where when you plug it into the data logger, it's automatically going to identify itself to the logger. So when you're going and doing the setup on it, you know, say with the MX1104 and you plug uh, one of our self-describing sensors into the fourth analog channel, you don't have to say what type of sensors plugged into it. It automatically identifies itself to that logger. So again, just some time saving features uh, during deployment. Um, we also have now included a locking jack uh, where the cable gets plugged in. Um, so it uh, uh, eliminates um, any issues with maybe the cable slipping out or someone accidentally pulling on it or knocking it and it coming out. So when you stick the set, uh, the 2.5 millimeter jack into the logger, you simply give it a quarter turn, that locks it into place. Now you don't have to worry about it coming out. Um, this logger actually has um, probably one of the highest uh, memory capacities of any of our standalone data loggers, which is 1.9 million measurements. And again, these are battery powered and you'll get about a year's life uh, out of these at one minute or greater logging intervals. And here we have some other of our commonly used uh, Bluetooth data loggers. Uh, so any of our um, frequent hobo, uh, hobo users, you may recognize that top left one. Um, that's our tried and true MX1101 temperature and relative humidity data loggers. We see this very frequently used in you know, museums, preservation houses, flooring companies, you know, HVAC audits, uh, things like that. Uh, to the right of that is, uh, it's essentially our outdoor version of this, which is the MX2301A. So again, it does give you a temperature and relative humidity reading, uh, but what we do is put it in a weatherproof casing so um, you can deploy it outdoors uh, in any weather condition, rain, sleet, snow, hail. Um, the only thing you can't do is take it and completely submerge it. Bottom left um, is actually, it's our uh, waterproof temperature and light data logger. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, a lot of times some uh, clients will use our outdoor or water data loggers indoors. This is a great example for that. So in a museum setting where maybe you need to track temperature and light levels, this is a really uh, low cost option um, for recording that. And then lastly is our, uh, CO2 slash temperature uh, slash RH data logger. Um, this is very uh, popular during the COVID era, uh, just to ensure you know your HVAC system was properly uh, properly circulating the air on set schedules. I believe it was something to the effect of you need to ensure the air was circulated three times in an hour. Don't quote me on that, but for some reason that comes to mind. Um, another neat feature about this particular data logger is while it is battery operated, um, you can also run it on um, AC power. So essentially you get a little wall wart, um, you know, like uh, for an iPhone or Android phone, connect the USB cable to that. And that would allow you to run it primarily off of that AC power. And then if you're to ever lose power at your facility, it would revert to the backup. Also, this logger is compatible with both our Hobo Connect app for your mobile device, or you can also connect it to a computer running our Hoboware software uh, if you prefer to go that route. And that may uh, prove beneficial uh, in a situation where maybe you're at a client's facility who doesn't allow you to use any devices that transmits Bluetooth data. You could always offload that information from it via USB. And here's just some additional measurements that we have for a Bluetooth data logger. 
Uh, we essentially covered most of these. Uh, just to point out a few that we have on here um, would be dew point. That's actually a calculated channel that all of our temp and RH data loggers will do. And essentially it takes temperature data, relative humidity data, and calculates dew point from that. So really with a logger, you know, like our MX1101, uh, you're really getting three measurements um, out of that uh, one data logger. Um, again, light intensity, AC, DC, current, and voltage. Uh, we have absolute pressure. We also have air velocity sensors you can connect to this. Um, pressed airflow, differential uh, pressure sensors, gauge pressure sensors, which again may come uh, prove beneficial if you need to monitor, you know, um, compressed air lines or water lines, you know, for a sprinkler system or something. Uh, that's a very useful tool. And then also uh, four to 20 milliamp signals we can capture uh, with these uh, these loggers. Um, really the only analog signal uh, that these uh, ones can't record are pulse. Um, we have specific data loggers and sensors designed for uh, recording pulses. So while you can use our uh, Bluetooth data loggers as uh, standalone options, um, a few years ago, we released a gateway for these loggers, which essentially takes them as a standalone device into an IoT solution. Um, so very similar to how they uh, communicate with a mobile device. Um, as long as the data loggers are within 100 feet line of sight from our gateway, uh, the, the gate would be able to pick up that Bluetooth information and transmit it up to our cloud-based platform, uh, Hobolink. The gateway itself uh, does need uh, AC power. So if you're, um, and it does use an internet connection to transmit that data to the cloud. So if you're using, you know, uh, Wi-Fi for the gateway to connect, you would have to plug it in via the uh, included AC power supply. Or if at your facility, um, you know, your your Ethernet offers PoE, which is short for power over Ethernet, you can power the gateway that way. Um, it does give you the ability to enter an SSID and password for the wireless network. And also, if you choose, you can uh, enter a static IP address if it's using a wired Ethernet connection. So while the loggers themselves um, have localized uh, alarms on them when you're using them as standalone. Incorporating this gateway does allow you to receive uh, remote alarm notifications. And that can be in the form of uh, text, email, or you can receive uh, both mess messages if you choose. Um, and this could be for something as an outer rage sensor, you know, i.e. a logger went missing, um, low battery, a logger stopped uh, when it wasn't supposed to, a logger went missing, or if you had set high and low thresholds on, you know, say a temperature or um, relative humidity channel, um, you can receive those alerts letting you know that there has been an excursion on those user-defined settings. And again, this does provide uh, near real-time measurements to Hobolink. So while you're using, uh, when you use our Bluetooth loggers as standalone data loggers, um, you can record data as fast as once a second. Uh, once you incorporate the gateway, you are limited to uh, once a minute logging as the fastest interval. And that data is updated, uh, again, as it says on here, near real time. And it's typically, you know, a couple minutes from once uh, the gateway receives a message before it is uh, populated within Hobolink. And lastly, uh, I'd like to go over our uh, web-based monitoring systems. Um, this is really more so designed for uh, long-term monitoring or areas where you maybe don't have the ability to get out there frequently enough to offload data, but you do need that data on um, a regular interval. So we do have two options uh, for our remote monitoring stations. The first is the RX2100, um, which we essentially call the micro RX. And then we also have our RX3000 remote monitoring station, which would be the flagship model of this product line. So the RX2100 station is a small, compact, versatile, and low-cost station that uses 4G cellular um, 
connectivity to communicate to the cloud. Uh, you do have the ability to connect it via an AC power adapter and uh, use rechargeable AA lithium batteries uh, for battery backup. We also have options if you're using this in an outdoor setting where it does have an integrated 1.7 uh, watt solar panel. And uh, also that includes a rechargeable battery pack. So during twilight hours, you know, it will uh, run off of that battery backup. Also with the solar panel uh, model, um, you do have the uh, option of connecting a larger solar panel. Um, you know, so say you're located up in, uh, you know, the remote Northeast or Northwest where during the winter months, you don't get that much sunlight during the day. Um, the 1.7 watt solar panel may not be able to keep that battery sufficiently charged. So you can always connect one of our five watt or 15 watt solar panels to it, just to ensure that you're getting enough um, uh, juice to the battery to keep it charged. Uh, the station uh, does include uh, five smart sensor ports, so you can connect up to five of our smart sensors. And then we also have them available with our Hobonet wireless sensors or our integrated water level and flow sensors. Next, we have um, the RX3000. Uh, which is very similar to the micro rx but there's just a few different um, options with this one so instead of getting five uh, smart sensor ports on it you do get 10 smart sensor ports on it and this one also supports uh, two modules uh, on the inside so that could be you know um, our hobonet wireless manager that you could connect to one of the modules to be able to use our wireless sensor network and then we also uh, have an analog module you could plug into one of the other ports where, you know, say you had a third party sensor that uh, outputs an analog signal and also requires excitation power to operate. That analog module can supply power to that sensor. And then again, it's just a matter of setting up the scaling for it. Um, we also have a remote water level sensor that you can plug into. Uh, one of those module ports that would allow you to monitor, you know, water levels down, you know, say a ground water, water stilling well or in a stream, river, um, you know, wastewater discharge basin, uh, uh, stormwater runoff basin, things like that. And then also we have a relay module, um, which essentially is designed to uh, send out a pulse based off of an alarm setting. Um, on one of the channels of the sensors. And that could be as simple as, you know, connecting like a beacon light to the relay module. So if, you know, the sensor plugged into channel one, you set a threshold of, you know, for the temperature of say 72 degrees and it exceeds that, it will send a pulse out of that relay channel and it could, you know, turn on that beacon light for you. So the workers on the floor know that there has been some type of excursion and they can be uh, proactive uh, to that as opposed to reactive. So as I mentioned, uh, we do have wireless sensors available for both the RX2100 and RX3000. Um, these wireless sensors uh, do form a self-healing mesh network, and they do have ranges of about 1,500 feet to 2,000 feet line of sight. Uh, and what we mean by self-healing uh, mesh network is, you know, say there's a sensor that's outside of that 1,500 foot range or, you know, you have it in a building where it has to travel through a lot of walls and partitions and floors. Um, if the sensor can't make a direct connection to the RX station itself, it can actually pass its signal along through other sensors in line, making up to five hops to get that signal back to the station. Uh, this is a scalable network and it does allow you to connect up to 50 of our wireless uh, sensors that do stream back to the main box. Uh, these are easy to deploy, uh, self-configuring with a push of a button, and that's essentially putting uh, the station itself into search mode, put the sensor into broadcast mode. After a few seconds, they'll make that handshake, and then that sensor knows that, uh, you know, this is the RX station I'm going to be talking to. 
And this, again, can prove beneficial if you're in an area where maybe you're running multiple RX stations. Um, one of the big questions that comes up is, well, how does the sensor know just to communicate with that? It's because they do make that handshake so it knows only to send data uh, to that one uh, uh, station. Just like all of our wired sensors, um, these do support a wide range of measurements for both indoor and outdoor uh, environments. Um, there is onboard memory to ensure no data loss. And that is with both the RX station and the sensors. All of them have internal memory. So, um, you know, say for example, uh, you lose cellular connection um, and the station can't send data to the cloud. It can actually store 2 million measurements locally. And once that connection is reestablished, it will do a batch upload of that data from the station uh, to uh, Hobolink. Uh, same with our sensors. Uh, they also have built a memory on it. I think it's 1.9 million measurements they can store. Um, and that, again, if uh, it loses connection with the station, it will save that data locally. Once that connection is reestablished with the station, um, it will, again, do the batch upload of that data. And very rarely do, do these sensors um, lose communication with the sensor. Uh, I'm sorry, the sensors lose communication with the station. The only instances I've really ever seen that is, you know, out in like, you know, um, you know, say like at a shipping company, someone comes in and accidentally, you know, puts, drops uh, three reefer trailers uh, in front of a sensor. And now the sensor can't communicate through all those trailers because they're in place and the signal's getting blocked. You know, once they move it out of the way, it, re it will reestablish that connection and do a batch upload. But, um, you know, very rarely do they actually uh, lose communication. Um, the sensors themselves, just like all of our other data loggers, they do run off of batteries. For our indoor sensors, they use two uh, AA lithium batteries. And for the outdoor sensors, it's two AA rechargeable batteries. Our outdoor wireless sensors do have an integrated solar panel on them. So essentially, you know, the sun recharges the batteries. The reason why we don't have that for our indoor sensors is because most of the time when you're indoors, you're not going to get direct sunlight. So um, to help keep the uh, sensors a little bit more cost effective, we removed the solar panel and just included two uh, AA lithium batteries. Um, and then also you will get about a year's life out of uh, the user replaceable lithium batteries. For the rechargeable batteries, you know, those will run for several years before they need to be replaced. But just like any rechargeable battery, um, you know, due to uh, just discharging and recharging, over time they will lose their ability to hold a charge or hold that charge for an extended period of time. Um, so if you ever see in Hobolink that, you know, your one of your outdoor sensors isn't maintaining a full charge or getting a full charge or discharging rapidly, that could be an indication that it's time to um, replace those rechargeable batteries. So we talked a lot about Hobolink in passing. Um, so now we can actually dive a little bit more uh, into our cloud-based platform. So uh, Hobolink being a web-based application, it does give you 24-7 uh, access to your data. Uh, you can use uh, Hobolink to verify our, uh, your RX station in HoboSent HoboNet sensors status remotely, you know, are they connected? What's the battery life in them? What was this latest management? Um, you also do have the ability to set um, and manage your remote, your remote alarms right over the web. So no need to go to the station to program those alarms. You do those right through Hobolink. You also have the ability to configure dashboards that, um, you know, allows you to highlight your most important measurements. Um, a good example of that is if you're in a large warehouse and, you know, you want to kind of section off uh, different sensors and have them all display on one graph, you can, you know, choose a specific widget, whether it's a line graph, thermometer, bar graph, and uh, add any sensor that is sending data to Hobolink to that one graph. Makes it easier for doing spot checks, things like that. Um, we do have an integrated Google Map feature on there, uh, which does allow you to essentially drag and drop where your sensors and station are on there. Um, 
And then we also have uh, uh, calculated channels uh, within Hobo Link. So um, again, dew point, which is calculated from temp and RH, uh, also accumulated rainfall, and then uh, ET, which is um, evapotranspiration. So here's a sample of our map view here uh, that a client was nice enough to share uh, that they had set up at their facility. Um, so as you can see, they do have their station localized in this facility, and then they put all their sensors around where they uh, have them placed. Now, this isn't um, doesn't use any type of GPS technology. Essentially, you just have to take an educated guess on the map as where you are. Um, but right from your map view, again, it gives you some important information. Um, you know, what is the current readings of it? What signal path is uh, the sensors taking to get back to the RX station? Uh, things like that. So um, very helpful for just getting a broad overview of your setup as a whole. So, um, when choosing your solution, there are kind of a few uh, uh, things you need to take into consideration. Are you looking for just a data logger or are you looking for more of um, an Internet of Things remote monitoring solution? You know, do you need alarm notifications or is this something where you're just deploying, collecting data and you're going to go back and look for trends in that data later on? Um, also, what's the length of your deployment? Is this uh, going to be something where you need a portable, where it's going to be a short-term deployment, or are you looking for a more permanent uh, installation? Then also, um, you know, if you're doing this for a client, uh, what's the access of the client's facility? Do they have internet? Um, if they do have internet, do they want? Will they allow you to use their internet? Um, you know. That might help determine whether the MX with Gateway or RX station would prove beneficial in that type of situation. You know, again, RX uses a 4G cellular network to communicate to the cloud, so no need to rely on the client's internet. Um, also, another benefit to the RX station is uh, that since it does use um, cellular connectivity to transmit the data, uh, even during a power loss, the station will still be able to transmit. You know, nine times out of 10, when you lose power at your house or your place of work, your internet goes down as well. You know, unless there's been a, a, something catastrophic, most times when there's a power outage, uh, cell towers uh, still um, continue to operate. So that might be a benefit uh, in going with an RX station. And then also powering your device. Do you have access to AC power or do you need to rely on solar power or some type of third party power supply, such as like um, a marine grade battery or something like that? And then, uh, you know, sharing your data and allowing people to have data access. Is this something where you're just going to be viewing the data yourself or are you looking to share this with clients and colleagues? And, you know, is it something where you want to have to send them data files or do you uh, want to give them access uh, to that data through the cloud? So from here, we'll kind of uh, touch base on some frequently asked application questions. You know, uh, what are the advantages of uh, to installing a green roof? Um, I'm sure you've heard a lot in the news uh, about heat domes and uh, urban heat studies. Um, so essentially covering a roof with soil and pants can pay off through the mitigation of stormwater runoff. Um, also not having that solid you know, black top on your roof um, does help uh, offset the interior heating and cooling costs, um, dramatically uh, increases the roof membrane life. You know, obviously, as you have sun beaten down on your roof, it is going to de deteriorate the material used there. Um, and to the effect that also redu uh, reduces the ur urban heat island effect. Um, another question is, what do I need to monitor a green roof? Um, well, that's kind of an open-ended question. Um, there really are some uh, key features that you need to monitor, but it's really dependent on what you have up here. Um, so for, uh, for a green roof, we typically recommend going with a web-based weather station that enables you users to monitor the conditions, um, you know, stormwater runoff, temperature, relative humidity, soil moisture, 
for healthy root crop vegetation without having to physically go up there and uh, manually offload the data. So for a setup like this, we would you know, usually recommend our uh, micro RX or the RX 3000, um, two rain gauges, and that could be one to capture actual rainfall. And a lot of times they'll place another one under the storm drains to calculate how much uh, you know, storm water runoff uh, came through there. You know, sometimes it will get stored in the barrel or it will just get fed uh, into the garden beds. And then um, another uh, measurement that would be important is uh, solar radiation sensors. You know, how much sunlight is, is this getting? You know, am I, am I uh, planting a crop that needs a lot of sunlight uh, in this particular area of the roof? I'm not getting any sunlight or vice versa. And then also we uh, recommend uh, monitoring wind speed and direction. That kind of plays a part into, um, you know, evapotranspiration. Um, you know, is the wind, is it, you're up on a tall building where the wind's quick, quickly drying off moisture or, you know, is, it, is the soil able to hold uh, moisture for um, longer durations? Okay, uh, another question. What do you recommend as a simple solution for monitoring HVAC systems to ensure optimal performance and proper uh, IAQ in a building? Um, that would be our MX1102A. Uh, which again is our CO2 temp and RH data loggers. Um, it does allow you uh, to uh, ensure that you are properly properly circulating fresh air and maintaining um, compliance with current ASHRAE uh, standards. Um, it's ideal for measuring and recording CO2 temp and RH in buildings, uh, office spaces, conference rooms. Um, it is a compact battery powered device. It is also Bluetooth and USB enabled. Uh, it does have a large uh, LCD display, which makes it easier for doing inspections. And then this one also has an audible and visual alarm. So, you know, if you're to set uh, high thresholds on the CO2 um, uh, channel, if it does reach that threshold, uh, the, the logger will start beeping for you to let you know that, hey, we may need to open windows or turn on that HVAC system. Um, and here's just an illustration of some best practices for uh, connecting current sensors to, um, you know, uh, HVAC systems, um, you know, and it could be a simple of uh, monitoring the return air temperature, the supply, supply air temperature, as well as the mixed air temperature. Um, and then also, you know, again, if there's a compressor motor that's driving these blowers, you could always monitor uh, current based off of that as well. Um, and, you know, a setup like this uh, applies to um, uh, industrial machinery, um, you know, anywhere where you have moving air and you need to track that temperature. Um, it also allows you to monitor production equipment uptime and downtime. So, you know, if you're trying to uh, uh, ascertain if you have a properly sized HVAC system for your for your facility, this is a great way to do that. You know, is this constantly coming on or is this system barely running? Um, the most common loggers used for these are our MX2302A, which are uh, weatherproof temperature and relative humidity data loggers. Um, that could be for something, you know, if you want to monitor the outdoor air temperature and relative humidity versus the temperature, the supply return and mixed air temperature in your HVAC system, you can deploy the MX2302A outdoors and then use our MX1105 four channel data logger to monitor um, your temperatures as well as uh, compressor um, amperage to see when it's on and off. You can also take it one step further if you wanted to, to see you know, how much it was on and off by connecting our UX90 motor on and off uh, data logger to that compressor motor, or you could also use our UX90 state logger if you have a relay that's connected to that motor to uh, determine when that uh, compressor or electric motor has gone on and off. And um, here's just a little screenshot of our UX9004 connected to an electric motor there. Okay, and then uh, what is a safe, inexpensive, and simple solution that doesn't require an electrician to identify sources of energy waste, or as we like to say, uh, identify potential savings? 
Uh, not to beat a dead horse, but this is a very popular data logger of ours, and that would be the um, our occupancy slash light on and off data logger. And again, um, lights are one of the biggest areas where energy is waste and then wasted, and also where you can uh, save money on it. So ensuring that your lighting system is functioning properly can certainly save you uh, money in the long run. Um, uh, these rooms are designed to monitor occupancy up to 12 meters away. Um, they are auto calibrating for on and off thresholds. So essentially you identify the logger, hey, this is what it looks like when the light's on. This is what it looks like when the light's off. And then every time there is a change in that lux or lumen, um, it, will, uh, it will stamp on the data file uh, when those lights were on and off. There is also an LCD screen on this um, showing signal strength. Um, to ensure that you're getting proper placement of um, both occupancy and light on and off. Um, if at all possible, it's not always the case, but if all possible, we do have a light pipe, um, which you essentially, uh, it almost looks like a little fiber optic pipe that you can connect to the data logger. And then on the other end, you connect it to one of the lights. That way you're not getting um, any outside influence. You know, say you're in you know, a conference room that three of the four walls are all windows, you know, trying to determine uh, if the lights are on and off, you know, versus direct sunlight coming in midday uh, might get a little hard using that light pipe. You know, um, it's only getting light from the light source that it's connected to, i.e. the light fixture that you have attached it to. Um, and this just will ensure that you're getting the most accurate data possible. Okay, then uh, what are the different types of wireless networks and how do I choose which one is best for my project? So again, with our uh, MX Bluetooth data loggers and gateway, they essentially use what we call a star network. So looking at this graph, ideally you'd want the uh, gateway in the center of this plot and then all the data loggers would be around it. And as you can see, they all connect just directly to the gateway. Um, they, can't, they don't pass their signal through other sensors in line. Where with our RX, uh, uh, or I should say our Hobonet sensors, um, again, they do form the, the uh, self-healing mesh network. So while it is ideal to centrally locate the station, um, if you can, it's not absolutely necessary. Because um, again, the, these sensors, they can pass their signal through other sensors in line, making up to five hops to get that signal uh, back to the station. Okay, then uh, interested in sensors that monitor both inside and outdoor connect, uh, conditions for use in automated controls, uh, you know, including wind, rain, et cetera. Uh, we do offer a wide array of data loggers, sensors, uh, standalone devices for monitoring outdoor weather and underwater applications. Um, so if you uh, do ever find yourself in a situation where predominantly you do do build and performance monitoring, but you have a job that comes up requiring outdoor monitoring, water quality, uh, we will have a solution for you. Then also, um, how is a 2,500 square foot suggested applied to office spaces or large facilities? So um, our data loggers, generally as a rule of thumb, we say they can cover up to 2,500 square feet in an open area, uh, but there are a few factors with this. You know, our, um, in this open area, you know, is where, where are the HVAC vents located? Where are the windows located? Um, so when you're trying to ascertain, you know, uh, uh, comfort levels for uh, your employees or in an office setting, you know, it may require you, even though the office may be smaller than 2,500 square feet, it could be something where, you know, employee A is sitting directly under an HVAC vent that's pumping cold air all the time, where employee B is, you know, 20 feet away, right against the window where the sun's beating in on them and they're not feeling that AC comfort. Um, so you could really help determine, you know, where hot and cold spots are. Um, by placing multiple data loggers in a facility like that. Um, and, you know, we have had an example where, you know, Sarah is constantly cold because the air conditioning vent blows directly on her during the winter. She feels cold because her desk is on a cement floor and against an outdoor wall. 
you know, when we did our study, we realized it was a three to four uh, degree difference from the thermostat to the floor. So um, that just goes to show you, you know, while we do say it's 2,500 feet, there's a lot of variables, you know, uh, what the temperature level is at floor level may be significantly different than what it is, say, six, seven, or eight feet up in the air. So um, sometimes it does require deploying loggers um, at multiple levels just to get a, a clear picture of uh, what the uh, conditions are. Um, and kind of the same thing here as we we're just talking about, you know, if there's different, you know, if it's a 2,500 square foot uh, office space, but there's partitions, walls, cubicles, um, you know, while one logger potentially could cover all that, it would probably require you placing data loggers in uh, each of those areas, you know, just to see uh, what those conditions are. And it may help you in the future if you're looking to update your um, HVAC system. Um, you know, where you maybe need to place more vents or maybe even where you need to remove vents from. All right, and then uh, we did recently have a, um, a, a study we did with a company called ENCO where they essentially used our data loggers um, to do some pre and post comparisons of um, uh, uh, application that they apply to roofs, which essentially does help keep the roof from overheating, which can cause buildings to heat up. So they essentially had used our data loggers to do some um, uh, pre and post uh, comparison of the effectiveness um, of their coding. Um, another uh, example here too is uh, thermal performance monitoring in two buildings that ENCO had did. Essentially, they had put in insulation uh, in one building and left the other one as a study, um, uh, I'm sorry, as like a static uh, measurement. And then from there, they're able to, um, you know, show that applying our coating, you know, helps keep cold air in, hot air out in the summertime, and then in the wintertime, keep hot air in and cold air out. Um, so one of our favorite sayings over here at Onset is that, you know, uh, proof is in the data. While we like to talk a lot about things, you know, you 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 can't actually prove it unless you have numbers to back up your statement, and that's where data logging ultimately comes into play. Um, and here's just a chart of their uh, of one of the buildings that was coded versus one that wasn't, um, just side by side comparisons. And again, this is all right through HoboLink in a dashboard. As you can see, they had set it up. Um, uh, with the uh, uh, widgets that made sense to them so they can see, you know, side-by-side -side comparisons of the treated and untreated facility. And if you are interested in learning more about this, um, they do have some online uh, resources um, uh, on the NCO website, which does go over um, uh, their applications. We also have it on our website, along with some uh, white papers on fighting, fighting uh, hidden energy waste with data logging, um, eight cost saving opportunities. Uh, please disregard this of the webinar event uh, that had already taken place. Um, I know we went a little late, but what I would like to do is uh, take this time just to go through some of the questions that I had populated and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, please note that um, any questions that were asked, we, we, uh, we do record these and we uh, can reach out to you to uh, answer those uh, for you. So let me just see here. Okay, let's see here. I see one, are the batteries rechargeable? You can use rechargeable batteries in our data loggers. We typically don't recommend it just because we can't guarantee the life out of rechargeable batteries. As I had said uh, in my statement earlier, over time, rechargeable batteries charging, discharging, uh, they do um, uh, lose their ability to hold a charge uh, over time. Um, What's the price of the MX gateway? The gateway itself goes for $375, and then there is a $75 annual service plan fee per gateway per year. And essentially that is just due to the uh, data traffic from the gateway to our cloud, as well as behind the scene maintenance. Um, can the sensor location be placed on a floor plan of a building? No, so it only uses Google Maps um, uh, for doing that map view. 
that is something that we're looking at doing, given clients the ability to import floor plans in the future. But as of right now, we don't have that um, that capability. Uh, let's see here. We use oven type temperatures, 400 plus. Perfect, Robert. I would definitely recommend our thermal couple data loggers. Uh, those ones can record temperatures in excess of a thousand degrees. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out our single channel and four channel uh, thermal couple data loggers. Uh, Juan Castillo, I do see your uh, question you asked here about all the MX1104s and Gateway you got. Uh, feel free to give us a call uh, or contact our tech support department. Uh, they'll be able to provide some assistance um, and you know maybe some best practices for placements. Let's see here, just trying to find some more general questions here. Are all temp and uh, humidity day loggers Bluetooth? No, so we do have temperature and relative humidity data loggers in both USB and Bluetooth. So uh, you get an option of how you want to receive your data. Uh, when is recording available? This usually comes out within uh, you know a week or two after it. Do data loggers monitor KVA? No, we don't have uh, KVA measurements, um, but a lot of times you can take some uh, raw data and convert it over to that if you know what the equations were, you know, based on amps, uh, voltage, and potentially even wattage. Um, is it possible to export data in CSV automatically? Yes, uh, Daria, within HoboLink, if that's what you're referring to, um, you can set up, uh, you can do data export, which is a one-time, data export, or you can set up data deliveries where say every Friday you want to receive a report of um, uh, the data that was collected. You can set it up where you receive that, uh, that report will be emailed to you in the file format you choose, CSV being one of them, um, and you'll receive that report every Friday or on whatever uh, schedule you had set. Um, I do see that we have gone a minute overhead, so I, uh, over our time limit, I won't take up any more of your time, but uh, my contact information is here as long as our, along with our general information. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of our sales team with any questions or concerns. We're certainly happy to help. And again, I wanna thank everyone for attending the presentation today. I hope uh, you have learned something new about our products.